begin Exodus chapter 25 tonight. Exodus chapter 25, the, the true tabernacle. And so from Exodus chapter 25 through 31, at this next section in the book of Exodus, we find the Lord giving Moses specific details on the building of the tabernacle. Not only the tabernacle itself, but of course all the furniture inside the tabernacle, and then all that would go into the priestly garments. And so all of these specifics. Now what's unique about this is not only does the Lord burn seven chapters right here on the, the building of the, on all of the specific details on the building of the tabernacle, rather than just saying a tabernacle was built, priestly garments were given, or even summing of it up much more briefly, not only are, does it stretch over seven chapters, but after, the, after Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and uh, and you have, and then you have uh, the you know the uh, the gold calf incident. Two chapters there. Then the the final seven chapters. One more time, the Lord goes through and gives all of those details a second time, when they're when it's actually built, and so the Lord says, okay, you're going to learn the materials of the tabernacle now at this time, how it was built and the purposes of the tabernacle. And why does the Lord spend so much time on giving us this instruction other than it is a type and shadow of the person and work of Jesus Christ? absolutely and beyond the shadow of a doubt we learn of christ and so the function of the tabernacle was this it was a meeting place for the people of god with their god and it was also coupled with a meeting place it was a means by which they would receive atonement for their sin and assurance of atonement for that sin so that they could come to this meeting place and be a full and free worshiper of God. And so that is the purpose, the function of the Old Testament tabernacle. Now get this, the tabern- Jesus is not a type of the tabernacle. He's not a second tabernacle. The tabernacle is a type of Christ. The tabernacle is but a shadow. So the tabernacle really was not of any real worth because the tabernacle could never really, ultimately, truly atone for sin and bring God's people into full fellowship with him. It was a type and a shadow of that which is to come, the person of Christ. And so when the Lord is writing the details of the tabernacle, when God is giving the details of the tabernacle to Moses, he firmly has Jesus fixed in his mind. And and he knows that this tabernacle is going to point forward to his son. And so if we know that going in, that that is the Lord's eternal intended purpose for the tabernacle, we pay greater attention to it. In fact, it's not sermon fodder to find typology here. The scripture tells us by the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 8.2 that Jesus was a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So different than the the tabernacle erected in the Old Testament. And then a few verses later in Hebrews 8, 5, talking about the priests who previously served the copy, notice, and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle for he, that's God, said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. (laughs) 
like the Lord said, you be sure that you build it just like I tell you to build it because every piece, every thread, every, every ingredient is important to the picture of who Christ is. So that's what we will look at. And of course, we're mindful of John 1.14 where we read, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that word dwelt, maybe you've heard this, maybe you know this, maybe not. But that word dwelt there in the Greek is the word for tabernacle. And this, word, this verse could actually be translated in the word, or, or Jesus, the word introduced in John 1.1, 1, 1, the eternal word of God, tabernacled among us. And tabernacle, although it does mean tent, ultimately the word tabernacle means dwelling, dwelling place. So yes, it was a tent, but it was ultimately this place of dwelling. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, well, let's jump right in. And before we build the tabernacle, we need some stuff to build it with. And so that's where we look at in verse, uh, verses 1 through 9. Exodus 25, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. So uh, not only does the Lord here in this verse command God's people to give, from this verse we'd realize not only does God command his people to give, but he commands his people to command his people to give. Here God is commanding Moses to tell his people to give. And so I know sometimes we can have trouble if the, if the church leadership or the pastors urging generosity, but ultimately the Lord urges generosity. But specifically when we're considering the offerings of the tabernacle, this becomes utterly important because the people had that which was needed to build the tabernacle. And so the Lord says, go and urge them to give and to give freely, willingly. Later on, we'll realize as we, as we see the people then come and give, later on in Exodus, they actually bring so much that Moses has to restrain them from giving because they were so happy to give, so happy to have the tabernacle, that they brought way too much more than was enough. And, and we would even, uh, some uh, uh, conservative es estimates would say that there was about 2,000 pounds of gold that the people brought to, for the tabernacle and, about, uh, and then about, um, and about four tons of silver. So about a ton of gold and four tons of silver. And that's just two of the precious metals, let alone the wood and all the other materials that were brought. And so the people brought indeed more than enough. And then the Lord, and the Lord says, he wanted them giving willingly. And yet Paul says the same in the New Testament. He says, you know, that God loves a cheerful giver. That when we give, we're not to give out of necessity or, or begrudgingly, but rather God loves a cheerful giver. And, and so we know that the Lord uses our time, our resources, our talents, but ultimately our spiritual gifts. And, and in fact, I, it, there's an interesting uh, note to consider here. As we consider on in verse 3... Uh, the Lord asked for some specific stuff. And he says, And this is the offering which you shall take from them. <laughs> uh, gold, silver, and bronze. So we begin with those three precious metals. And then in verse 4, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Also, fine linen, goat's hair. Verse 5, ram's skins dyed red. They had the ability to do all of this. Uh, badger skins. And then also acacia wood, which we'll talk about when we, more when we consider the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant. Also, they were to bring oil for the light, sp spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. Remember, it would be a, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Verse 7, they were to bring onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So these are all 
various kinds of jewels that we'll read about later uh, that were placed in the priestly garments. And then verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so there we find the purpose and the function of the sanctuary. Uh, and sometimes it's called the tabernacle. Sometimes it's called the sanctuary. It takes five or six various different names, this, uh, this tabernacle of the Lord. And, uh, and then in verse 9, and according, notice, and then this is the first time we receive this command, but it won't be the last. And I already quoted it once from Hebrews 8, 5. According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnish, furnishings, just so. You shall make it. Moses, get it right. Do it just like I'm telling you. And uh, the gifted artisans would come up and put all of this together. But, there, but, but before we go on into the Ark of the Covenant, the, the first piece of furniture that you find uh, in, the coven, in, in the Ark, let's first just consider these articles that are brought. Let's not look at each of them individually and what they might represent. We'll look at them more in greater detail later on when we consider each of the pieces and how these pieces fit together and how they were used. However, first let's just consider the whole list, the whole Home Depot shopping list, so to speak, that you, that you would have here. Where did the people get this stuff? They were slaves in Egypt. Where do they have all the gold and the silver and the bronze and the blue thread? Raise your hand if you know. Where, how? They plundered Egypt, right? Yeah. They, on the way out of Egypt, they plundered Egypt. And the, and, they, and the Lord said, on your way out of Egypt, let every one of you ask articles of silver and gold and all of these precious things. So on the way out, they said, oh, by the way, sorry about the 10 plagues, uh, but can I have that? And they're like, yeah, take it, just go. Like, and so they come out with all this stuff. Now, it's important here, okay, because this was the exact stuff that the Lord needed to build the tabernacle, which would point to Christ. They needed blue purple scarlet thread. They needed gold. They needed acacia wood. They needed these things. They needed oil. They needed incense. And it would all point to Christ. Now, consider this. The children of Israel were in bondage and they were delivered through the, through the death of the firstborn. The blood of the lamb delivered them. And then they come out and they plunder and they receive gifts and then those gifts come into the desert, and, and then that, those gifts come together. Everybody brings their own gifts together, which was freely given to them after they were delivered from bondage to build a type of Christ. You see where I'm going with this? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 uh, says, Therefore, when he ascended on high, this is Jesus, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So in our salvation, when Jesus delivered us from our sin by, the blood, by his blood, he then gave gifts, spiritual gifts to men. And then Ephesians 4.13, after it talks about how the Lord gives some to be pastors to equip the saints, so the saints do the work of ministry through their spiritual giftedness. Ephesians 4.13 says, till we all should come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a, me the, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The idea is this. After the Lord delivers us from bondage, he freely gives us gifts, and then he asks us to use them. And he says, freely give your gifts, your spiritual gifts, your talents. And when the church brings our gifts in, we build up the church, which is, a t which is the, the dwelling place of Christ. And Christ is seen. And so as they freely use their, share their gifts, which were freely given to them, the tabernacle is built. So 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 becomes fitting here. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Uh, if anyone ministers, uh, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability that God supplies that in all things God may be glorified 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so that is how the Lord is glorified today as we are delivered and we all bring our gifts. And so immediately we see that uh, the tabernacle uh, was able to be built as a type of Christ just because the Lord delivered and then freely gifted and blessed the, the Israelites with the ability to give. It also just reminds us of the simple premise of giving. If the Lord ever asks you to give, he's only given when he's freely given you. And, and you have nothing that's your own. And, and the Lord's only asking for you to share what he's bountifully blessed you with already. Now, we get into the, the, these, we'll look at tonight, three pieces of furniture, and we begin in the innermost part of the sanctuary. So it's just interesting as we consider the tabernacle, we don't begin with the outside and then we furnish it. We begin with the most important innermost piece, the Ark of the Covenant. And then we're going to move out from there. And we'll look at three pieces. And we'll, of these three pieces, we'll spend the most amount of our time here just in the Ark of the Covenant. And then we'll look at the table of showbread and then the lampstand in conclusion tonight. So verse 10, we then move now to the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And we read here in verse 10, it says, And they shall, and you, or they, the, gar, the gifted artisans, as God speaking to Moses on the mountain, and they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. Uh, you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. And two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. So uh, the ark of the covenant, much has been written about it, said about it. Uh, we should not have in our mind the raiders of the lost ark, you know, Harrison Ford here in some magical box, you know, that does some crazy thing. This was an actual piece of furniture that was placed in the tabernacle, but oh, was it an important piece of furniture. Not only, and, and really to, to, to use the word furniture, although that's what it is, really misses the point because this piece, this box served a massive and mighty function, okay? It was to contain the Ten Commandments. And it was to be placed in the most holy place before the Lord. And it was to remind God's people of the Ten Commandments and that God was holy. That's why it was placed in the holiest of all or the holy of holies. There's the tabernacle, then the holy place, and then the most holy place. A 15 foot by 15 foot square enclosed in, in cloth of this most holy place. And this was the only piece of furniture in the most holy place. But above this was a lid, a propitiation lid, or we could call it the mercy seat, surrounded by two cherubim. And this mercy seat was sprinkled then with blood. And this is where the Lord says, here I will meet with my people for I will atone for your sin right here. And so in function, the Ark of the Covenant was a box of mercy by which the children of Israel, whom had failed to keep the Ten Commandments, could find mercy and acceptance in the presence of God through the shedding of blood. Obviously, this was a point in a picture of Christ. This pointed forward to Christ, who alone filled the, fulfilled the law for us. And through his shedding of blood, gives us acceptance into the presence of God. And so when the Lord says, build the ark just this way, 
He's doing so to remind us of the person and the work of Christ. Let's consider some of the details of this ark and even how the Lord is seen in some of these. So in verse 10, we, we saw that it was to be made of acacia wood. Acacia wood would speak of the Lord's humanity. Uh, acacia wood was a strong wood that would grow in the desert, and it, it was a long-lasting wood. Uh, the, the acacia wood itself, uh, if it was pierced in the evening time, would produce, uh, it would ooze a certain sap that was used for many medicinal purposes. Think about how Christ pierced in the evening for our transgression and the healing of the nations. You know, he's the great physician, not only heals the sick, but he, he heals all our diseases, ultimately our iniquities. And, and uh, this, this box was, so two and a half cubits by a cubit and a half, a cubit and a half. Uh, the cubit measurement, if you're not familiar with it, many of you probably are, was 18 inches. It was the common reach from the, the tip of the finger to the elbow. Uh, for a Middle Easterner, I don't know, mine's probably two and a half feet, I don't know. And, uh, but, um, and so it was just, that's an easy way of them measuring during building, how many cubits would it be? So about 18 inches, and so two and a half by one and a half. So this box was, was 45 inches uh, long by 27 inches deep uh, by 27 inches tall. And, uh, and then it was, of course, overlaid with gold. Uh, with pure gold, verse 11. Inside, outside, there would also be a gold, pure gold molding all around it. It was beautiful and intricate. Verse 12, it would have, of course, four rings attached to it. And then two poles that we read that would be inserted into these, into these four rings. And then here specifically, now other pieces of furniture would also contain the rings. As we'll read about the tab, the the table of showbread would also have rings. However, one additional piece of information is placed here, and it's important. Uh, and it's in there in verse 15. It says, the poles shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. Like, don't lose the poles. And why, why were the poles to be inserted and not taken from it? because the Lord never wanted anybody to touch the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what it is, you take the poles out, you lose the poles, and then you're touching the Ark of the Covenant, and that eventually is what happened. Uh, we can read in Samuel when the, the Ark of the, the Covenant was, was stolen uh, by the Philistines, and then they put it on a, on, a, on a cart pulled by oxen and went back to the land of Israel, but then when the men of Jabesh Gilead saw it, they touched it, they opened it, and they, anybody who touched it died that day. And then later on, when, the ark was, when David became king and he was bringing the ark of the Lord into the city of Jerusalem for the first time, he uh, placed it also on an ark, not following the prescribed manner from Leviticus. The, the priests weren't carrying it with poles. And when the oxen stumbled, a man named Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, and he immediately was struck dead. And so David was afraid to bring it to his house, but then later on, the ark was, as it remained at the house of Obed-Edom. Uh, the, the, David saw that Obed-Edom's house was blessed, and so then he says, bring it, let's bring it in afterwards, but let's do it right. Let's bring the priests and have them carry it on the poles. And all of this just reminds us that God is holy. And, and, and so it, as the ark was placed into the holiest of all, it couldn't even be touched. And, so, and then the holiest of all, no man could go into the holiest of all except the high priest and he alone once a year. And we'll read about that here in some of that atoning work from verses 17 on. And it's specifically what happened uh, on that day of atonement between the priest. Uh, but, but God was just saying, I'm holy. And so that's why the Ten Commandments were placed in there. There were two other items that were eventually placed in the ark. Uh, do you know them? Uh, one was Aaron's rod that budded was, was placed in there, and then some manna as a memorial to what the Lord had. And, and we read of that later on in the book of Hebrews chapter, chapter 9. However, what we simply find is that this, this ark initially was uh, essentially... Uh, Four, four feet by two and a half feet by two and a half feet, wooden box, 
I believe the acacia wood points to us of the Lord's humanity, overlaid with gold, his deity, his glory, inside containing the Ten Commandments, and the Lord, the Lord Jesus, his, you know, I've come to do your will, your laws within my heart. Christ came as a representative of the law to fulfill the law, and it was in the holy place as God is saying, I'm holy, those who approach me must be holy, they must keep the commands. Only Christ could fully, fully keep it. But for all those that failed, they would need, uh, verse, verse 17 of what we read about this lid here, verse 17, and so you shall make a mercy seat. Uh, some translations call it the atoning lid. Some have traced the specific word mercy seat back to Martin Luther, who influenced William Tyndale, who, uh, had, who influenced the King James Version. And, but literally, the word just means mercy lid, <laughs> and a mercy seat of pure gold. It was a covering or a propitiation. And so it was of pure gold. Uh, it was, notice, the mercy seat was two and a half cu cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. The exact same measurement as the, as the uh, length and depth of the ark itself. So the mercy seat was the entire lid. That is the mercy seat. Verse 18. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, notice, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. And so two angels of hammered work, uh, as opposed to when Aaron later on would make a gold calf by just simply melting down the, uh, the gold and forming it into a gold calf, and we just think about the difference between idolatry and the way the Lord does something. When he says, you make the angels, these cherubim, hammered work. And the Lord's process is often long. And that's the thing about idolatry is it's a quick fix, isn't it? Just like immediate pleasure, that's idolatry. But the Lord's is just beautiful. Uh, this, these ha the hammered work of the cherubim. Verse 19, make one cherubim on one end, the other cherub on the other end. Uh, and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of, of one piece with the mercy seat. They would connect to it. Then verse 20, and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. I like that. And they shall face one another, and the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. Well, of course, Christ will fulfill this mercy seat, but I believe these angels are important, these two, these two cherubim. Notice they would face each other, and then their arms would cover the mercy seat. As though the angels are covering the Lord Jesus. And think about the life of Jesus, and let's think about angelic beings that ministered to Christ through his life. In fact, the most, the red, most ready occurrences of, of angelic appearances in Scripture are in regard to the person of Jesus Christ. First, the announcement of the Incarnation. The angel Gabriel appearing to Mary, and another angel, possibly Gabriel or another, appearing to Joseph. Then, on the night of the Lord's birth, the angels sing a angelic appearance to the shepherds out in the field. Then, when the Lord is tempted in the desert, after three times defeating the enemy, the angels come and minister to him. Luke's gospel tells us. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he surrenders his, his will to the Father, again, Luke's gospel tells us after his sweat became great drops of blood, angels came and ministered to him in the Garden of Gethsemane, the angels spreading out over the mercy seat. But then the last appearance, and then there's two more appearances of angels in the bodily ministry of Jesus. One, then, is after the resurrection, of course, the angels declaring it. But consider what John 20, 12 says when the disciples came and looked and, and when Mary Magdalene came and looked in John 20, 12, and she saw two angels. When she looked into the tomb, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of the Lord lay. And that slab there where the Lord lay, in essence, the mercy seat, now just completely, the, the stain of the blood still there. 
and the, the Lord's body now gone and the two angels on the side. And we have full and free access through. And then the last appearance, of course, that the angels, when the Lord ascended, the angels came and said, why are you guys looking up into heaven? The same Lord who came is going to come again in like manner. And so these angels that appear over the mercy seat remind us of the angelic ministry toward Christ in his earthly ministry as he satisfied the, the wrath of the Father on our behalf. Uh, and that's what propitiation means, or mercy means. It means the judgment of sin has been satisfied, has been met. There's no more anger against sin, no more holy wrath of God against sin because it's been met. And so that brings us to verse 21 where we read, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. So in the ark, the Ten Commandments, mercy seat on top, and then, and then verse 22, and there I will meet with you. I love that. And there, there at the mercy seat, I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in, in, uh, in commandment to the children of Israel. And there, so he says, there I will meet with you. Later on in Leviticus, we'd read this about the mercy seat. And this is, what, this is why the Lord was able to meet with them there. Uh, Leviticus 16, 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull of a sin offering. So the children of Israel were sinners, just like you and I, uh, which is one for himself, and that he would make atonement for himself, and, and then later for the people, we'd read later in the later verses, and shall kill the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself. And then the following verses, he would also kill one for the people. And then Leviticus 6, 14, and he shall take some of the blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on, on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So seven drops of blood. And again, remember Christ bled. Scripture tells us Christ bled from seven places on his body on the night of the crucifixion both of his hands both of his feet that's four he wore a crown, crown of thorns that's five uh, his his back was beaten scourged that's six and then his side was pierced that's seven and and so the lord pierced seven times for us and so there's this Greek word in the New Testament. It's called hilasmus, hilasmus. And it literally means mercy seat, mercy seat. And here's a few times that it's used. Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation or to to be the mercy seat for the sins of his people, to make propitiation by his blood, or, or for the sins of his people, yeah. Um, and then Romans 3.25, God set forth him, or Christ, as a propitiation, or as the mercy seat, by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, and in his forbearance, passed over the sins previously committed. Or 1 John 4.10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his only son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then there's a parable that Jesus t told, or maybe a true story of, of two men that went to it, the te temple and one, the high priest who thought he was better than everybody. He's like, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector over here and I pay tithes and I, and I fast twice a week and he, and uh, then there was that tax collector, remember, who couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. And he prayed, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, uh, and uh, there in uh, Luke 18, 13, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And today I was reading uh, Philip Graham Riken uh, from the Preach the Word series commentary. And Philip Graham Riken noticed, he said, you know, this is that word mercy seat. And one, he said, and really in the Greek, this word, God be merciful to me, a sinner, should actually be translated, God be merciful to me, the sinner. There's a definite article there. God be merciful to me, the sinner. And he says, and even more uh, accurately, or, or more literally, I should say, it should be translated, Lord, be my mercy seat, I'm the sinner. <laughs> and as if to say, I am the sinner. And then Philip Graham Reichen said, he goes, you know, this studying this passage has made a profound difference in my life. And he said, and, and so I tried to pray as soon as I'm conscious that I'm awake every morning, I try to let the first thing uh, be that I pray, as soon as I know I'm awake. And he goes, and I try to pray this, God be merciful to me, the sinner. <laughs> and I just start my day that way. And it's just kind of like me getting everything square. I know who God is, he's a merciful God. And I know who I am, I'm the sinner. And, I'm, and, 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 and then from that point on, I can talk to the Lord about anything else I need to. And I just would present that to you even now. And maybe you've blown it again today. Maybe, it's, maybe you've fallen short again this week. And you just need a merciful God. Well, you have one in Christ. He is your propitiation. And it is there through the person and work of Christ that you have full access into the Holy of Holies, into, into the throne room of God, where you can meet with him, the Lord. Now let's look at these last two uh, pieces of, of uh, furniture here in, in Exodus 25. We won't take forever doing it. Uh, there's the table of showbread in verse 23. Uh, you also... Uh, you shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, and a, a cubit its width, and a, and a cubit and a half its height. And so similar measurements to the, to the Ark of the Covenant, just a little more narrow. Verse 24, and you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. So similarly, it was, a, uh, it was made of acacia wood. Again, the Lord's humanity overlaid with gold, deity, uh, 25, you shall make for it a frame or a hand breadth all around it. So there'd be a, maybe a three-inch uh, wide framework around it, maybe to keep items on. And you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at the four legs. Legs would also be carried. Um, verse 27, the ring shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to be near the table. And make it more steady while carrying it. Verse 28, and you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and the table that the table may be carried with them. Uh, you shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. Uh, you shall uh, make them of pure gold. So this table would was to hold showbread, uh, but these other utensils would be used for offering some incense offerings later, uh, drink offerings that would be poured onto the altar of incense there, and so some of the other items would be set on this table. No cupboards in the tabernacle. Uh, verse 30, And you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Later on, we would read that the, this bread would be baked with fine flour. There would be frankincense, of course. That was one of the, the spices offered to the Lord at his birth. Um, and, and that fresh bread, 12 loaves, would be baked every Sabbath day and placed on this table of showbread. And then on the, and then on the Sabbath day itself, the priests would eat that bread. I know, weak old bread. But, uh, but uh, they would eat it, and then they would bake fresh bread. And the bread would be there continually. Uh, when I travel in India, uh, we often see, or not India as much as uh, Thailand or some of the other spots where I've traveled, Sri Lanka has more Buddhism there. 
Uh, but in, in some of these places, especially where Buddhism is prevalent, one thing you'll find are uh, these little Buddhist shrines, and then there's like little soda pops and candy and things placed there for these these gods. You know, you're like, well, they have hands, but they can't handle, and they have mouths, but they can't speak, and they can't eat that food you've given them. And so, unlike pagan places where food is placed before idols, it, there it's placed to appease these gods and to receive favor from these gods. That's not why the showbread was placed out before the Lord. The showbread was placed out before the Lord as a picture of fellowship, of the Lord meeting with his people, and where there would be satisfaction and blessing from the Lord to them, and them sharing with the heart of the Lord. Of course, this is a picture and type of Christ, who on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you, for you. Remember Jesus said on that night, how I've longed to eat with you. And, and because the Lord gave his life, we remember John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever believes in me will never hunger. He who comes to me will never thirst. You know, it's like the Lord satisfies our deepest need. And it's ultimately through fellowship with himself. And so the, the, the table of showbread was to be set before the Lord always as if to say, this is where I'll meet with my people. And so Christ is that, that showbread. He is that, that table of showbread. And it's for God's people. And we even remember when, when David was uh, ditching away from Saul and he came to the priest. Uh, and, and the showbread only lawful for the priest to eat, but the priest gave it to David because he was hungry. And there we realize that the bread, the Lord's life is for us all. Well, that brings us finally to the, the, the gold lampstand here in uh, verse 31. Uh, you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece. So it was one piece, hammered work. Uh, later on, we'll read that it's 75 pounds of pure gold. One piece, 75 pounds of gold. Um, the word lampstand here is the Hebrew word, say it if you know it, menorah. It's where we get our word menorah. And, uh, it's, it's, and if you've seen the Jewish menorah, there's one straight candlestick, right? And then three loops that, that come through, essentially sending three branches off either side of, of the menorah. So, that's, so if you have that in your mind, that's what we're reading about. Um, and that's what Moses saw up on the mountain. And uh, verse 32 it says, And six branches, six branches shall come out of its side. So it would be seven candlesticks, right? Six branches coming out of the side. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Uh, verse 33, there would be three bowls shall be like the almond blossoms on one branch. So, so, like every, so this is every branch, all six branches would have this, three bowls. These are smaller bowls along the branch uh, with an ornamental knob and flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and flower. So when it's saying one branch, the other branch is talking about the branch that passes through the candlestick and then on for all, all three or all, or all three couplets or six branches. And uh, that's where it says, and so on for the six branches that come out of the lampstand, meaning that each of those knobs would have little, like three spots, ornamental knob and a flower. But then the main branch, verse 34, on the lampstand itself, this is the main prong straight up the middle, there would be four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with an ornamental knob and a flower. So in between each of those. So if you would consider each of those branches passing through the candlestick would lead leave two spaces in between the three branches. So there'd be an ornamental knob at the base, then a branch, then an ornamental knob, then a branch, then an ornamental knob, then a branch, then an orma ornamental knob, then, then the lamp. And you can picture it that way. Four, that's why there's three on the one and then four on the other. And uh, then verse 35, and there shall be a knob under the first two branches uh, of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same. Um, and so 
explaining what I just explained to you about those knobs inter intersecting there, according to the six branches that extend from the lamp stand. I meant to have a picture of it up here for you. That would have been easier. Verse 30, uh, verse 36, sorry about that. Uh, their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece, and all of it shall be of one hammered piece of pure gold. Uh, you shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that it may give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold, and it shall be made of a talent. A talent is 75 pounds of pure gold with all these utensils, and see to it. And then one more time, uh, church, here in verse 40. See to it that you make, um, make, make them according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. So you'd say, what is the purpose and function of the lampstand? What is the purpose and function of the lampstand? The purpose and the function of the lampstand was to give light to the priests while they were in the holy place, not the most holy place. The lampstand was in the holy place, which was 15 feet by 30 feet, just before the most holy place. And they would go into that part every day. Most holy place only once a year, only the high priest. The holy place every day to, to offer incense, to trim the lamps, and the, the, the light in there was to help them to do their services unto the Lord. And so we would consider that this is a picture and type of Christ who gives us light in ministry, gives us light to do his will, gives us light to follow him. So not only does the Lord give us light to bring us out of the darkness of sin, think about the woman caught in adultery. She was brought out into the light of day sin to be exposed. Whoever condemns her, throw the first stone. Nobody condemned her. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go in peace. And then he said, John 8, 12, then he said to her, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And there we realize that this woman, freed from her sin, had light from Christ to do what? Follow me to follow Jesus, to do his will. And so the light in the tabernacle is a type of Christ that not only light to lead us out of sin, but light to do the Lord's will. And oil there is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And now as Jesus has ascended to the Father and he's given us his Holy Spirit, we could consider a vision that Zechariah saw in Zechariah chapter four, where he saw a menorah and up above the menorah, a golden bowl filled with oil and seven branches running from this golden bowl into the seven lamps by which they would be continually fed with oil and light. And then the Lord said there, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so the, the lampstand, reminds us of the light of Christ in our life, not only to walk free from sin, but to serve him effectively as today we are kings and priests in his kingdom, right? And so, and so again, a beautiful picture of the type of Christ enlightening the way of the ministers of, of the Lord there as the, as the Lord would be worshiped and as the people would gather in his presence. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your, your deep and abiding love for each one of us. Thank you for meeting with us at the mercy seat. And Lord, we thank you uh, that you are the bread of life, that you're the light of the world. Lord, and as we consider uh, the purpose and the function and the specific designs of the old, of the tabernacle found here in the Old Testament, Lord, we thankful, we're thankful for how it points us so specifically to you. And Lord, we love you. We're thankful that you forgive us. Lord, have mercy on us, sinners. And Lord, feed us as we walk with you, fellowship with you daily. And Lord, light our path as we serve you, that the light of the Spirit of the living God would be on us fresh and new tonight. We love you, Lord. As we depart from here, let us go out with joy and peace. Uh, we delight ourselves in you today. In Jesus' name, amen.